Welcome back to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. Today we'll be picking up part three of our notes on chapter 15, looking at section six, applications of equilibrium constants. And predominantly what we're going to be looking at today is something I've mentioned in the last part of notes, which is how do we handle things when we're not at equilibrium and how do we know we're not at equilibrium? What we use is the reaction quotient Q. Now Q gives the same ratio as the equilibrium expression. So basically the Q equation is the exact same as the K equation. The difference is we don't really know if we're at equilibrium or we definitely know we're not at equilibrium. So the concentrations we're plugging in won't give us a K value. But for um, remember, the system's not at equilibrium then, but it's the exact same reaction. So to calculate Q, one substitutes the initial concentrations of reactants and products into the equilibrium expression. And since you're not at equilibrium, you won't get the same calculated value that you got for K. So remember, it's the non-equilibrium K. Same expression, but the number that we're going to get is not necessarily a K. Now we could be at equilibrium, so if Q equals K, that's exactly what that equals. And that's what we'll be looking at next, or what are the different situations here. So if Q ends up equaling K, we knew our concentrations then were at equilibrium. So that's the first situation. When you do your Q calculation, if you get what the equilibrium concentration is supposed to be, within reason. I mean, if you're very, very, very close, then you'd say Q equals K and we're at equilibrium. So that's the first and easiest situation. Well, what would happen if Q is greater than K? Now, remember, the idea here is we have products on top in our K expression, our equilibrium expression, and reactants on bottom. So the only way to get a value for Q that's greater than K is if our amounts, our concentrations on top, were higher than they were supposed to be, and that would give us a greater value for than Q would be, or than K would be. So whenever Q is greater than K, what you know is your product amounts are too high, your reactants amount are too low. So equilibrium is going to have to move towards the reactions. It's going to shift to the left to achieve equilibrium. So what we're going to be doing here is moving in that direction over the course of the reaction in order to achieve equilibrium. So when Q is greater than K, we know we're shifting to the left, moving towards the production of reactants. On the flip side, if K is greater than Q, since it's products over reactants, that means our number on the bottom was too large or larger than our equilibrium concentrations would be. So we know that we are too far to the left and we would favor the forward direction in this reaction moving towards products in order to achieve equilibrium. So Q is greater than K, we know we're going to end up shifting to the left. If Q is less than K, we're going to end up shifting to the right. Now. If Q does not equal K, then remember, you are not at equilibrium. That's exactly what that means, and that's important. So when Q is not the same as K, we're not at equilibrium. Now, Q can be used to determine if the change in concentration in our icebox table, remember the C, I said this in part two of notes. Sometimes we don't know if we're moving towards products or moving towards reactants as we achieve, achieve equilibrium, because maybe it wasn't a simple problem of we have all 100% reactants, no products, Obviously, we know that's going to be moving to the right. 100% products, no reactants. Obviously, it's going to be moving to the left. But if we have some concentrations of reactants and products, the only way to know which Cs are going to be positive and which Cs are going to be negative would be to calculate your Q. So that's one of the major uses of this is in relation to, to icebox problems. So really, Q can help us decide whether it's going to be a positive or a negative value. So are we shifting to the right? That means reactants will be going down negative x and products will be going up positive x. Or are we shifting to the left? If we're shifting to the left like when Q is greater than K, that would mean that we're going to be negative x from the product point of view and positive x from the reactant point of view. So if Q is greater than K, it's going to be plus x for the reactant change and therefore negative x for the product change. But if Q is less than K, it's going to be negative x for the reactant change and positive x for the product change. Think it through. It's not that hard. If you remember, and I've said this many, 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 many times, products over reactants. If you remember that and think through what that ratio is giving you, None of the stuff is that challenging. Now, a trick with K and Q that I've seen, and if you're having trouble figuring out which to shift, use this. It works every single time. It's, it's one of those little beautiful tricks. Step one, write the two in alphabetic order. So instead of Q and K, or like we were just looking at, now we're going to have K and Q. 
Now next, you're going to put in a greater than or less than sign between the K and the Q. So if K is greater than Q, then you would put the greater than sign. If K was less than Q, you would put the less than sign. Once you've done that, draw a line to make an arrow out of your greater than or less than, and it's going to show the deep, uh, shift direction of equilibrium shift, and it works every single time. So remember, if you're not sure, write K and Q, look at your numbers and figure out if K is greater than or less than, add a little bit of tail here, and you can make an arrow that tells you which way equilibrium is going to shift. So that's a simple trick you can use. Okay, using Q. As an example of how this could be used, Oh, I'm sorry, an example of how this could be used is if something is added to a system at equilibrium. So we have a system at equilibrium and we're dumping, dumping something in. If we're dumping in reactants, obviously that's going to make our reactant concentrations too high. We're going to have to shift right and so on. So if 0 0.045 moles of H2 is added to a system at equilibrium, and this is the system that we were just looking at a second ago in problem number two. So we had the problem number two system situation. We're at equilibrium, and we add 0 0.045 moles of H2. Now remember, assuming the total liters uh, or the, the total volume was one liter. So in this particular situation, this is what we've got. So we have our ice table set up here. Now at the beginning, remember we had everything as was because we were at equilibrium, so we had this amount for H2, this amount for I2, and this amount for HI. Now, if we dump in a little bit more H2, that's going to cause this initial concentration to go up. So now we're going to have a greater quantity there than we had before. Now, because we have too many reactants, we added some reactants, that's going to cause equilibrium to shift to the right. That means we have a negative X from a reactant point of view. And by the stoichiometry from our product point of view, it would be going up by positive 2X. Just like always, I plus C equals E. And now we've set up our equilibrium expression. Now, since we haven't changed temperature, K hasn't changed either. So we can set up our equation again. And remember, I just went through all this. Q was less than K. So that means equilibrium is going to shift to the right, and that means we're going to decrease by x. And when we plug those things into our same old expression, remember, equals the same thing it was before, 50.5. Now we get this form of the quadratic equation. Just like before, if you plug that into your quadratic solver, it'll return your values. In this case, we get 0.0372 or 1.40. Oh, and remember, it can't be both, so evaluate based upon our ice table what's happening. Now, in this particular case, since we had 0 0.100 as our value for H2, obviously having something greater than 1 and subtracting is going to give us a negative concentration. Throw that out. The only one that makes sense is if our x happens to equal 0 0.0372. And when you plug in your numbers here, you can calculate uh, your new concentrations at equilibrium. Now, an idea that's related to some of these concepts that I want to mention at this time is when you have saturated solutions, if you think a second, if you dump a bunch of salt into water, the salt is going to keep dissolving until it reaches saturation point. Well, at that point, it's still dissolving, but it's dissolving and recrystallizing at the same rate. We have equal and opposite reactions in a closed system. An aqueous situation is a closed system from the ions point of view. So all solution situations are actually equilibrium situations. It's really what this comes down to. So the equilibrium concentrations in the equilibrium expression would actually represent the saturated concentrations of the dissolved ions. It actually tells us our saturation point. When you go to do problem 50 in your next homework set, and this is uh, something that's also going to come back at the end of chapter 17. We're going to talk about this again. Keep this idea in mind. So this is a hint for problem 60. And that finishes our fourth set of notes. We will talk to you tomorrow.